Good morning. You know, I'm super excited this morning. There's a glowing thing that I'm seeing in the sky. I haven't seen it in a while. I'm going to need somebody to explain to me what it is and what do we need to do with it. I'm super excited. God's good, isn't he? All the time. We are praising God and we are glad that you're here. We're able to worship God, to gather for communion, be able to hear from his word. I'm excited about uh, this morning's study as we take a look at uh, Matthew. A couple of things that I want to bring to your attention as we get going. To this afternoon at 4, our uh, marriage fellowship is going to meet. We're going through Romans. And uh, I want to encourage you, we'll have our Bible study at 4, and then uh, we're doing breakfast for dinner at 5, and all the kids will be here. And So if that fits your category, we want to encourage you to join us. We're going to be able to get together and study God's Word as, yeah, and just encourage the, the next generation of the church, the married couples and the ones with kids. And then Thursday is the Sisters Book Club. They're going to get together so you guys have an opportunity to be able to meet. If you're interested in joining that group, it is an open group. We want to encourage you to be able to get plugged in. Check out the church office and call them and they'll let you know. Also, we have that spring forward fall back thing that's coming up on March 14th. Did we lose an hour of sleep? I'm praising God it's not on Easter sunrise morning though, right? That makes it really early. But we're excited to do that. And then that, we're coming up to our Easter uh, celebrations and we are doing something just way cool this year. So we are starting this whole process of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus a bit earlier. On Thursday, March 25th, we are going to have Jews for Jesus come out. They're doing a Christ in the Passover uh, presentation. But what's going to happen, it's interactive. So we're going to have the missionary up here, and he's going to set up the table and do all that. And then we have tables out here where you're going to have some of the elements. You're going to really learn. If you have not uh, interacted with a uh, Passover and, the Christ, and seen how Christ is demonstrated in the Passover, you've got to be here. So that's going to be on Thursday, March 25th at 7. We want to encourage you that. And then also we've got coming up a Palm Sunday celebration. And then we have a great Good Friday celebration that's going to happen. And then on Wednesday, March 31st, we're going to have a family communion. I want to encourage you to bring your kids, your grandkids, here because I'm going to be explaining what communion's about. And then we're going to do uh, communion together. And the reason being is it, we really need to teach the next generation about the Lord Jesus Christ, about communion, what does it mean in all of these things. We'll take a look at the upper room discourse a bit. And then also uh, there's a great opportunity for baptism. If you haven't been baptized, we know that, that Christ calls us to be baptized. There's going to be a baptism class on the 28th. And then we're going to have baptism the following Sunday. But we'll baptize you anytime. Just let us know. We want to meet with you. We want to encourage you and with those things. So let's go ahead and let's pray and ask for God's blessing on this time. We'll ask and we'll say thank you for all that God has given us for this week with offering. If you've brought something, you can place it in the receptacles. You can do it online. But let's just take a pause for a minute. God, you're amazing. Lord, you have given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. God, as we come before you as, as your kids, we realize that the very breath that we breathe is a gift from you. Lord, we want to give to you our lives this morning. Lord, in giving to you our lives, we, we give to you the first fruits of that which you've given to us to be able to honor you. So these offerings that we brought this morning, whether we place them here in the receptacle, do it online, mail it in, God, we just want to acknowledge you this first day of the week that you're the giver of everything. And we praise you. And Lord, that's what we want to do even now. Praise you. Worship you. And honor you. Because God, you are worthy to be praised. May our voices be a sacrifice of praise. May our lives, our hearts, be given to you in an act of worship. And Lord, in all these things, may you smile. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand up and worship our risen Savior this morning. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. 
He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars and believe. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. Oh, he's alive. All honor and power, they are His. All glory forever, amen. Jesus lives. Hear the shackles breaking free. Hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving, He is moving, He's alive.
walking along beside us and we come here each week to worship his holy name as we just sang but we also want to see him we don't see him with our physical eyes but we want to see him through the eyes of our faith we want to see his glory we want to see him move in this place this morning because he's here standing right next to you to meet you at your place of need. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Make this your prayer this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 open the eyes, open Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Shining in the 
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out the power in love as we sing. your sons and daughters this morning we stand here in your presence for one purpose and that is to tell you how grateful we are how much we love you and we desire more and more of you We want to be filled with your glory, with your presence. We want to see you high and lifted up, and that you would be honored in all of the earth. As we turn to your word, we thank you for revealing yourself. Make us more like Jesus. So that then when we leave this place, we can share with others of the good news of how you've transformed our lives and that you are a good, good God. Amen. You may be seated. Of this call. Oh. And then after that, make a few texts, update my Facebook status, tweet about it, shop for a deal on a new laptop, write on my blog about the experience of shopping for a new laptop, tweet about blogging about the experience of shopping for a new laptop. And even though my brain and my flesh are demanding that I play with this thing. <sighs> I'm not. Not because it's bad, not because I can't live without it, but I'm stepping back from this beautiful little piece of technology. I'm taking the time that I would have spent on that, and I'm spending it on my relationship with Christ instead. Yes, I'm talking about fasting. And I know what you're thinking. Why'd you have to go there? Isn't that a bit extreme? And I get it. I really do. But truth be told, if it was so important to Jesus, it's got to be important for us. I mean, the dude didn't just fast. He went into the desert and slept with coyotes and snakes and, and didn't eat anything for 40 days. <laughs> I get 
agitated when my pillow gets lumpy. Can I just confess something to you? I am all about me, and I hate that. I want, I want to be all about Him. I want His will for my life. And if that means giving up a, a phone or a few meals, some TV, in order to get closer to the God of the universe who daily showers me with grace and love and holds me in his hands. <laughs> what a small price to pay. I, I'm ready to take the focus off of me. It's pretty easy to make it all about me, isn't it? We think about all of these things that trap us, that encapsulate us within our life, that control us, that drive us, that keep us uh, focused on things that are other than God. It is so easy to make life all about me. We have a world today that, that reinforces that position that kind of ideology. And within this, Jesus is challenging, even in his day, that kind of thinking. The Pharisees and the scribes of his day were displaying a kind of righteousness that really was all about them. And as he's starting a new work with these disciples, he's taken them out and he's teaching them, it is not all about you, it's all about God. And that's what really righteousness is about. Having a right heart that really is all about God. In this, we, we can go and we say, okay, well, in this teaching that Jesus is giving, what are you really telling us? When we approach scripture on a Sunday morning or in your private reading, you have to ask that question, God, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to know? Holy Spirit, what are, you, what are you doing in my heart to transform my heart within this? Well, the disciples at this time were a blank slate. Jesus had picked these guys along with the, the crowds that were together, and they were on the hillsides just north of Capernaum, just outside of that area in the Sea of Galilee, and he is teaching what is called the Sermon on the Mount. We look at that, yeah, we know the Sermon on the Mount, we know all the things that, that he's doing, but he's really calling us to live that undistracted life, to be able to continue to uh, live according to the standards. It, when we started this study a number of weeks ago, we looked at living according to God's divine ethic, as we would know the Beatitudes. And then we took a look at living as a kingdom influencer, how we can impact the kingdom of God then we looked at what real righteousness is. It's overcoming the negative behaviors and really developing the positive behaviors that God would have us to live. And then last week we took a look at what righteousness is. It's really living for an audience of one. And he's continuing that conversation in that audience of one, dealing with the third of the three Jewish pieties of the day. One was almsgiving, as we covered last week. It was this idea of charity. And then the second one was prayer. And today we're going to take a look at fasting and really focusing down on, on getting rid of some of the things or rejecting some of the things that can take us away or distract us. Have you ever been distracted in your spiritual journey? It's pretty easy, isn't it? You're going along and everything's going great, and then all of a sudden, squirrel. And you're like, where did that come from? Then we get distracted. We get distracted with electronics. We get distracted with all of these things. And so one of the things that fasting does is that we're going to see is it helps us to recenter. 
it is something, it's a practice that we'll unpack, that we, that we want to take a look at. But we have to push back against hypocrisy. I don't know anybody that says, I really want to model my life after a hypocrite. Do you? Wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to become a religious hypocrite. We don't do that. But it's a behavior that comes up in our lives when we make it all about us. Hypocrisy robs us of righteousness. Hypocrisy also robs us of our spiritual rewards. And hypocrisy will rob us of our ability to be a spiritual influencer. Why? Because people can tell a fake, can't they? They look at it and they go, ah, you're, I don't, no, I don't want to be like you. Jesus in, in this new movement, the church age that is launched with the disciples, is calling his disciples to reject hypocrisy, reject making religion all about them, and make it all about God within this. And that's our focus. I'm going to ask that you stand, and as an act of worship, we're going to stand out of respect for God's word. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6. I'll read it. You can follow along. Beginning with verse 16 to 24, as Jesus continues to teach, he says this in verse 16, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men. When they are fasting, and truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust and where the thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust and where thieves do not break in or steal. Note, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, and so if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, and let's take a look at it. So the first thing that we've got to understand is that the righteous heart avoids the stage of piety, this public piety that is there. The righteous heart does not say, I want to be able to demonstrate this, this realm of piety, this religiousness, this religiosity. Someone asked me, is this really, religiosity a really a word? And it's like, yeah, I just said it. <laughs> it's a word. We look at this, and, and Jesus says, look, at, you, you need to avoid this. So he says, when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast. And so we've got to kind of take a look at this concept of fasting. We as Western civilization, especially as Americans, like food, don't we? Food is good. We have food shows. One of my favorite shows is diners, dives, and drive-ins. I love it. I mean, he does all the stuff and all the wacky food. It is good. The only problem is after I watch, you know, a couple episodes, I'm hungry. It doesn't work so good. But we understand that fasting was part of a religious culture back in Jesus' day and even prior to that. You say, well, where did fasting come from? Well, for the Jews originally, it was a one-day-a-year fast. It was on the Day of Atonement. That was the day that all the Jews were to gather. They were to take a look at this day as a solemn day and that their sins for that year would be paid for by sacrifice. And so there was a fast according to Leviticus, and you could look it up later. Leviticus chapter 23, we find it. And then it's also referenced in Acts 27 under the Mosaic Law. It was a time of reflection and devotion where you set aside your meal for the day and you were to set it aside just to really put it towards prayer and really recenter yourself. Do you guys live busy lives? I do. Is it really easy to get out of balance? Yeah, it is. 
We get up in the morning and we do the same thing and then we do the same thing week after week and all these different things. And one of the things about remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy is to help recenter yourself, corporately and personally. But fasting can do that also, and so God would call for that fast through the Mosaic Law once a year. Later on, as the Jews would go into exile, and as they were in exile, they developed three more fasts, or actually four more fasts, in, in, a, in addition to the Day of Atonement, to help recenter them. Why? Because they were out of their land, their ability to worship as normal was, was not uh, available, and so they would fast four times in exile. The word fasting in Greek is nestia, and it literally means to suffer hunger and to, ab- to temporarily abstain from food for religious purposes. In other words, it was to take something that you were doing daily, like eating, and to say, I'm not going to eat during this time, but I'm going I'm to use it for devotion, I'm going to use it for, for prayer. So you can see that it was important. There was, we find in the Bible that fasting was also part of either national fasts, so the whole nation could be called to a fast, or individuals would fast for different things. So the rules are kind of broad. What's also interesting is it's not typically just a Jewish thing. History tells us that Greeks and Romans would also fast in some of their different things, so it was a religious thing, it was a personal thing, to forego this this food or this meal for a period of time to be able to be focused within this. We know that Moses fasted when he went up on the mountains and received the first covenant, the, the, the Torah, the law, 40 days up on top of that, that mountain. We know that Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 4, would also fast when he would go out and get ready to receive that second covenant, 40 days. How many of you guys can do 40 days without food? <laughs> How many guys can do one day without food? How many of you guys are having a hard time thinking about, I've got to give up one meal? It's hard, but when we take a look at it, it was, it was a personal decision to be able to do this. What is interesting, though, is fasts are not mandated for believers. It is an option. It is something that you can do. Jesus changed their thinking a little bit, which really freaked out the, the, the Pharisees. In fact, we read about it in Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, when Jesus' disciples were confronted. It says, and they came to him, and they said, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and they said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendees and the bridegroom cannot fast. Can they? So as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Well, a couple of things are happening. They say, well, Jesus, your disciples don't fast like everybody else does. What makes them so special? What happened to fasting? Did it go from optional to mandatory by this time? For sure. And there was this concept was, if you were religious, you would fast. If you were devoted to God, you would fast. But the reality is, Jesus says, fasting is to be able to hear and be devoted to God. And if God is walking with them physically on earth, do they need to fast? No. But they'll fast again. Why? Because it's part of their their practice, part of their devotion. It's, It's not a huge deal. Pharisees would fast every Monday and Thursday. That was their days to fast. That was their their obligation of what they would do. And if you were a good Pharisee, you would fast every Monday and Thursday. Later, the church, by the way, church came out, Christianity came out of Judaism, right? So much of the practices continued on into Christianity. Instead of meeting on the Sabbath on, on Saturday, they would meet on Sunday. Instead of fasting on Monday and Thursday, they would fast on Wednesday and Friday in the early church. And then they added a couple other fasts. They would fast prior to Resurrection Sunday or the Lord's Day that they would celebrate. They would fast prior to baptism. In fact, they wrote a piece called the Didache. Have you ever heard of it? The Didache is literally called the teaching. And it was the first document. It was a manual to Christianity that was practiced by the early church. And in the Didache, chapter 7, verse 4, it says this, But before baptism, let him who baptized baptizeth 
and him who is baptized fast previously, and any others who may be able. And thou shalt command him who is baptized to fast one or two days before. So it was mandated for baptism under the Didache. And then in chapter 8, verse 1 of the Didache, it says, But as for your fasts, let them not be with the hypocrites, for they fast on the second and fifth days of the week, but you fast on the fourth and the sixth days. In the first generation after Jesus, they came up with a manual on how to do this. And it was part of their practice. Why? Because they're picking up on all the stuff from the, the legalism of, of Judaism in itself within this. Jesus says, when you fast, don't be like who? The hypocrites. So fasting is not a bad thing. Fasting is a good thing, but it's a very personal thing. And there could be times when the church collectively would call for a fast, or individually we would, as small groups, or even as a family unit. You could do that. So how do we do it right? How do you fast correctly? Well, don't use the hypocrites as your model. Notice in verse 16 he says, don't appear as the hypocrites. Why? Because they put on a gloomy face. They neglect their appearance to be noticed by men. They alter their physical appearance. You remember what the word hypocrite means? Hypocritos? It means actor. So as a hypocrite, as an actor, what are you putting on? You're putting on the gloomy face. Literally in Greek it means they disfigure themselves. They let themselves, their appearance drop. So they don't wash, they don't brush their hair, they don't do the things that they're supposed to do. And as people will come up to them, they go, oh, you look a little bit off today. Oh, yeah, I'm fasting. Today is my fasting day. I'm foregoing it because I really want to be closer to God. I'm sorry if my appearance offends you. And it was all this drama in this show that was there. They would change their outward appearance so their peers would, would see their pious deeds. And Jesus says, don't be like them. In fact, the people that put on the show, you get your reward. What is the reward that the actor gets for a good show? It is a applause. That's your reward. There you go. God is not going to honor that. You got your reward, and it really doesn't do any good. I got to thinking about this, this idea. What is Jesus saying? He says, don't be like the hypocrites who play for an audience of many. A real heart of worship plays for an audience of one. <laughs> then I let my mind wander a little bit more, and I thought, well, how often do we do this? And, and one commentator brought up the, the concept of hymns. Think about this. How we sing some of these hymns, and he had a list of them, but I just picked out a few, and I thought, interesting. How we can be hypocritical in the songs that we sing. For example, old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. How many guys like that one? Do you pray for an hour or five minutes? What about this hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers? But God's got to draft you to be in his army, kicking and screaming. We sing, Serve the Lord with Gladness, but we gripe and complain whenever we have to do something. We sing, cast your burdens upon the Lord, but then we worry with great anxiety. We need what comes out of here to really represent what's going on here and for that audience of one, and not to play the part, but just be real. Be real before God. Be real before God, and, and, and don't do it for other people to see or to applaud you. We worship for an audience of one. So he says in verse 17, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, get cleaned up. Anoint your head with oil. It was, it was part of the Near Eastern culture to anoint your head with oil. Why? It's dry, it's arid, you know, to be able to, to take care of yourself. Wash your face. Just do what you got to Hygiene. Hygiene is an important thing. I can tell you that for sure, having been a youth pastor and worked with junior high boys. <laughs> it's an important thing. 
Sorry, junior high boys. I'm just affirming what your mom has been telling you. We, we look at this, but the whole idea is this personal practice of piety needs to be for an audience of one. And Jesus says, just when you fast, just keep doing your normal day of your hygiene and, and so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but noticed by God. What does this tell us? God is watching. God's looking. We are always, always before an audience of one. Whether we're in this room or you're in your house. You're like, oh no, that's maybe not so good. Yes. You're before an audience of one in your house, in your room, driving your car. Oh, you'd had to go there, right, Carrie? Yes. Yes. That everything is an act of worship. And so we need to focus on that. And so really the righteous heart is going to reject human praise and reject this, this pious demonstration and really seek after just honoring the audience of one. Jesus changes gears now a little bit. And then he focuses even deeper. We focus on, on the outward appearance, but Jesus is saying, no, God's going to drill down to the treasure of your heart. In the next section, in verses 19 to 21, he gets into dealing with really the treasures or what you value. He says, do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth rusting and destroy and thieves can break in. He calls the followers really to, to seek out the, the heavenly treasures, those things that are most important to you, the things that are there. He's challenging, in verse 19, materialism. Now, I know in the Western culture, we don't have a problem with materialism, do we? No, we don't. We all drive cars that, you know, that, are, that are older. We live in houses that are, that are just right for us, and we don't have a problem with, with you know, the style of clothes or these things. We don't have a problem with that, do we? It's hard in the Western culture dealing with materialism, but I can tell you materialism, regardless of the economy, affects everybody regardless of how much you have, because it's an attitude of the heart. It's an attitude towards money and prosperity and possessions. And how do you have a right heart and live a balanced life with your money, your, your possessions, and the things, all of these things? How do you live that balance? Jesus is not saying having money is bad. Jesus is not saying having, he's not calling you to a monastic lifestyle. What he's calling you is to, to check your heart and where that focus is what your value system is. He, he speaks mostly to a working class. And in a working class, especially in his culture, in an agrarian culture, it's day to day. In a working class, you, you, you know, and it's, it's like living paycheck to paycheck. And the thing is, what is, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, is there worry about is there going to be enough for the next week or for the next month? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so with that, what would you tend to do? Store up for the future. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not. But it's how you handle it. The, the hypocrisy of materialism says, I trust in myself more than I trust in God. And I need to store all of these things up for me. Why? Because I don't trust that God's going to give it to me later or God's going to give it to me or take care of these things. Literally, he says, do not treasure up your treasures upon this earth. Putting all of your energy into accumulating. What is it like? What does that look like? Imagine putting all of your energy and effort into treasuring up these treasures. How much energy do you have left for treasuring up the things of God? Can you do that? No, it's it, It's impossible. We say, well, we try to live a balanced life to do that. No, it's your value system. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, and again, Jesus is not calling people to poverty, and Jesus is not calling people not to save. Solomon would write, Go to the ant, O sluggard, and observe her ways, and be wise. Watch, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food for the summer and gathers her provision for harvest. So he's not saying just to live for day to day and not to 
to look forward to the future, or you know, if you're looking for retirement or whatever the case is. That's not what he's saying. And he's not saying that you can't enjoy God's provision for the day. Interesting. First Timothy, Paul would write for, to Timothy in First Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it says this. Men who forbid in marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be grateful, shared in by those who believe, know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. There was this asceticism that was going on in the day that said, look, if you're going to be really holy, don't get married and don't have possessions. Just devote yourself to God. And Paul is saying to Timothy, tell these guys to knock it off. God created it and enjoy it if God provides for you. But what he's saying is don't make it the focus of your heart. Don't make it your driving focus. The, the righteous heart really comes and values the things of God. It's, it's not, as he would say to Timothy, it's, it, it's not money that is evil, it's the love of money that is evil. That's the problem. And so we think about this, we think about the, what he challenges, the, the riches of this world is all going to rot. In James chapter 5, verses 2 through 3, he says, Your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire in the last days that you have stored up for treasure. In other words, when you stand before a holy God, and, and God says, what did you do with all the opportunity that I gave you? You say, well, look at my bank account, look at my 401k, look at my house, look at my car. And he says, yeah, but what did you do with Jesus? What did you do with Jesus? See, that's the challenge. That's the wealth that, that we have the opportunity to enjoy. Everything in this world can be stolen, right? Everything in this world can burn. We've seen that with our fires, haven't we? Can it all go away in a, in a blink of an eye? As a firefighter, I can tell you this. I have been on many fires where I've watched whole households just be demolished in a blink of an eye. But what can you not lose? The rewards that are stored for you in heaven. Those things that are, that, that are there. It says the thief comes in and, and, and literally digs in. Why? Because they had clay walls. Can you imagine having all your possessions stored in your house and all they got to do is just dig through a hole in a wall and steal it? And it's all gone. And, and, and people are, are decimated. Then what do you have left? Wealth in the Near East was made up of metals and cloths and all these things. And when they're all gone, they're all gone. You, and, and you can't take that treasure with you. I heard of a guy in L.A. and saw a picture. I went looking for the clip because I thought it was just interesting. He loved his Corvette. Loved it. Great Corvette. It was a, it was a, a I don't know, a 70s model Stingray and just gorgeous. And he petitioned L.A. County to be buried in his Corvette. And one. And the picture is, a, it's a caption of this guy. It says, it, who said you can't take it with you? So they put his body inside the Corvette, and they're lowering this Corvette into the ground. And I'm like, no. But he didn't want to, you can't take it with you. Billy Graham used to say, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. If you Google it, you'll find them. But what does Jesus say? He says, treasure your treasures in heaven, verses 20 to 21. It's that righteous heart that values the heavenly treasures. What are those treasures? What are those treasures? The treasures that are treasured in heaven are the good deeds that are done with the righteous heart. They're rewarded by God. It's the good things that you do, the charity, the almsgiving, those things that you do on behalf, those are honored by God. What else is treasured in heaven? Suffering for Jesus' name. Being persecuted. That's rewarded in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Serving one another on earth. That's treasured in heaven. If you take a look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, it says this, And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Kindness and serving one another. That's a good thing. 
and, and so when you're serving, and, and how do you do that? You can do it in your occupation. Can you be a servant in your occupation and serve the Lord? Sure. Can you do it in school? Sure. Can you do it just on your daily stuff? Yeah. I got to tell you something funny, though. You got to be careful when you're serving somebody. Yesterday, I had the opportunity. I was going to Subway to go get a sandwich. I'm walking by, and there's this gal, and she's coming out of the Dollar Tree and pushing a cart, and her cart's kind of loaded. And she's, she's fumbling with the door and trying to get her cart out. And I came up. She didn't see me coming. But I came up, and I grabbed a hold of the door to open it, and she almost went down to the ground. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry. <laughs> and she looked at me like, because I probably should have asked first. Can I help you? Announced my presence. And so uh, she was a bit startled and, and, and whatnot. And so I thought, oh, that, that could have gone really bad. God, you know. So we look at this, and, and so that's what he's saying. Treasure these treasures in heaven. In verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What, do you, what is the first thing that comes to your mind about your most precious treasure? What is your most precious treasure? What is, it, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And I would caution you if it's anything that is temporal. You say, well, Carrie, I'm having a hard time thinking about it. Then I'll put it this way. What is the thing that you're most scared of losing? That is your most precious treasure. Within this, we've got to understand, if your treasure's in this world, then... That, that focus is very carnal and very materialistic. If your treasure's in heaven, then you're heavenly minded and your heart is righteous. Jesus is going to wrap up here, and, and when we get to 633, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all of these things will be added to you. That's the focus of the righteous heart. Rejecting the treasures of the world, just focusing on the treasures of heaven. Then in verses 22 to 23, he talks about influences. He talks about the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, whole body's full of darkness within this. The eye is the lamp to the body. It's what comes in to, to your soul within this. This thing is a gate, is it not? What we look at. What we see, what we allow comes in here. While hearing, yes, but, but there is so much stimuli that comes in through our eyes. Satan knows that. That's why he messes us up. We are visual people, aren't we? And even more so, the contamination that comes through the eye. Whether it's the movies, the TVs, the video games, uh, all of these different computers, screen time, all of these different things can mess with us. I was reminded of the Sunday school song, and I looked it up because I didn't know all the verses. But it's a challenge. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You guys know that song? For the Father above is looking down in love. And then it goes on to describe, be careful, little ears, be careful, little tongue, be careful, little hands, be careful, little feet, be careful, little heart, be careful, little mind. Great theology, teaching our kids, and we should be teaching our kids to be careful of what we allow to come into our eyes, what we watch. As a young person, if your parents say you can't watch R-rated movies, it's not because they hate you. It's because they love you and they want to protect you. Because you can't unring a bell and you can't unsee things that you see. Once you see them, they are there forever. Once it comes in, it is there forever. You can't undo this stuff. Your brain is a huge computer. It stores all of this data and all of this information. And once it goes in, Satan is really good at picking it out and using it against you. Much like fasting abstaining from these things and making those decisions that we have to be careful. He says if the eye is, is good or literally healthy, then the whole life is filled 
with light. Why? Because Jesus is the light. John chapter 8, verse 12 says this. He says to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life within this. The if there is the third class conditional clause. It says if or the potential of. Why do we need to read God's word? So the word goes through the window into the soul. Why do we need to avoid garbage? Well, the old saying, garbage in. That's the way it works. Jesus is giving to his disciples clarity and saying, if you want clarity in your life, you need to focus on this. The danger is we develop what's called spiritual cataracts. If you're an older person, you're going to understand what cataracts are, right? It's that funky stuff that kind of goes over the eyes, kind of gets it all clouded and all of these things. I remember when my dad had his cataracts removed. He said, I couldn't believe I could actually see colors. Why? Because they, glow, they grow so slow, you don't, realize, you don't realize what you're losing as the cataracts come. And then all of a sudden, a doc comes in and does the surgery. By the way, don't ever watch the surgery prior to having it done. It'll freak you out. And they go in, and they, you know, they do all this weird stuff, and then, and then all of a sudden, you come out, and you're like, I can see again. Because the cataracts was removed. We've got to understand that there is a potential as a Christ follower to, ha- to develop these, these spiritual cataracts that cloud our eyes. It's called getting older in, in the world and becoming carnal and materialistic. These things come in and they cloud our vision. And that's why we pray and we sung, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, so that we can see. And we need to be able to see. And we need to guard our heart But how do you guard your heart? By guarding the inputs, by guarding your eyes within this. The last thing that Jesus says in verse 24, he says this, no one can serve two masters. He's either going to hate the one or love the other. The righteous heart is going to reject duplicity. The righteous heart's going to reject duplicity. I'm not going to be a two-minded person. I'm going to seek to serve after God. Why? Because you cannot be righteous and be duplicitous in your life. There is no room for compromise. God never allows for compromise. You will have to serve one master. You can only serve one master. You say, well, I can serve two. No, you can't. You're lying to yourself. One is going to be in charge. The first command with a promise, the first command, one God, that's it. One God. The problem with a, a duplicitous person is you, you, you become hypocritical. Well, in this context, I'm serving God. In this context, I'm serving the world. No. Even in hypocrisy, that is not serving God. You can't serve the two masters. You can't have syncretism. You can't be worldly and godly at the same time. And that is the greatest danger that we have in Western civilization that we think that we can worship God on on Sunday and live like hell on Monday. You can't. It is impossible. Then your worship is, is, is not true. It's been said that unless you're willing to serve God alone, you're not willing to serve him at all. And that's a powerful statement. Unless you're willing to serve God only, you're not willing to serve him at all. Matthew chapter 8 verse 18 says this. Now Jesus saw the crowd to him and and they gave orders to depart to the other side. And the scribe came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, I don't have a house. You're going to come after me. You're going to give up your house. Another disciple came to him and said, Lord, permit me to go bury my father. Jesus said, follow me and allow the dead to bury the dead. And you say, well, Carrie, that's pretty harsh. His dad, his, his dad died. He has to go bury his father. No, you've got to understand the context of the statement. His dad wasn't dead yet. He was waiting for his dad to die. In other words, my devotion is to my family, and after I deal with my family issues, then I'm going to come serve you. He says, no, leave it. Come follow after me. 
You're either going to be heavenly minded looking to God with that pure heart, or you're going to be earthly minded looking out for your own interests. And the righteous, the righteous heart really is focused on God. That hypocrisy will rob us of our righteousness. It'll rob, rob us of spiritual reward. And it'll rob us of our spiritual influence. That's why the righteous heart really has to focus on God. And that's why seeking first the kingdom of God is so important. Now, how do we get there? Well, in order to seek the kingdom of God, you've got to be in the kingdom of God. Jesus came and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. That sin that separates you from having a relationship with God. That sin that creeps in, that creates, creates duplicity within our mind. That sin that, that contaminates our thinking. That sin that drives us to look after self. That sin that qualifies hypocrisy. How do I get there? God tells us in his word, if you confess your sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. And that forgiveness is based on the sacrifice of Jesus. We're going to celebrate communion. What is communion? Communion is a reminder that tells us Jesus loved us enough to give himself for us. His body was put on that cross and, and, and suffered the full wrath of the Father on your behalf. His blood was shed to forgive you of those sins so you could see God clearly and you could be forgiven. Do you know the one who has had their sins forgiven stands before a holy God, holy, righteous? And Jesus gave this command, as often as you do this, remember me. We're going to do that even now. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you give to us the privilege of being in your presence, the privilege of having those sins forgiven. God, we know that, that it was all done at the cross. And we come to you before you, God, and we are, we are a messed up group of people. God, search us even now, our hearts. Search our minds. Father, as we consider the bread and the cup, these tables that are set before us, may we be reminded that it is by your sacrifice, Jesus, that you've made us free. Free from the world, free from hypocrisy, free from carnality, free from materialism. Lord Jesus, you set us free. And Lord, there are times when in this journey we mess up. But you hear our confessions, you wash our feet, and you call us your sons, your daughters. In a moment, the worship team is going to lead us through a song, The Stand. It's a position that you take in your heart that you're going to serve Jesus. During the song, please take the opportunity to come up if God moves on your heart to partake of communion. Not everybody has to. If, if you haven't asked Christ in your heart, don't take communion. Don't make it a ritual. Make it an act of worship. As if no one else is in the room. You have an audience of one. And Jesus is watching. Come and take the elements. Hang on to them at the end. When everybody's had a time and opportunity, then we're going to pray over those elements and take them together. God, we thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts even now. In Jesus' name, amen. You stood before Eternity in your hand. You spoke the world into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. Carried 
the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? God, we stand before you, your kids, saved by grace, sins forgiven, because of what you did, Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you, we honor you. God, this is all about you, all about you. This is our act of worship from our heart to you, saying thank you, as we remember the cost of this great salvation. If you would, pull back the cellophane and reveal the cracker. This piece of bread reminds us of the body of Jesus. You realize that Jesus left his throne of heaven, came to earth, humbled himself, added to himself humanity to walk on this earth, experience everything that you and I would experience, yet remain without sin so that he would be the perfect sacrifice. A perfect man brought sin into the world. Only a perfect man could atone for that sin. We would never be able to do it. And he allowed his body to be beaten, humiliated, to be mocked, spit upon, marched through the streets, hung on a cross to take on the full wrath of his Father 
for all the sins so that you and I would be forgiven. God, we hold this bread up to you and we thank you for this bread and all that it means. And we, in our puny little minds, have no idea how much this means until we get to heaven and we get to see your glory in comparison to, to this fallen state. God, we will be rejoicing you, but for now, we remember. We thank you for this bread. We receive it by faith as, as a gift from you. In Jesus' name, let's all take it together. We would pull back the cellophane, or I'm sorry, the foil. The grape juice reminds us of the cup that Jesus picked up from the table. He said, drink all of this. This cup, this cup is for the remission of sins. And as often as you drink this, remember me. And I won't drink of the fruit of this vine until that day that we're gathered together. But until then, the church is to gather together to be able to drink from this cup and to eat the bread and be reminded of what our Savior has done for us. Though our sins were red as scarlet, by the blood of Jesus they are washed white as snow. You stand before a holy God perfect, forgiven, cleansed, not only from your past sins, your future sins, because the blood of Jesus not only has cleansed us in the past, but continues to cleanse us in an ongoing. That is special. God, we thank you for this cup and all that it reminds us of. And as we lift this glass to you, we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face, Lord Jesus and you will lift that glass again. But till then, we remember, and we thank you in Jesus' name. So I'll drink a cup. As an element of, we learned earlier, almsgiving, charity, we set aside a special offering, the first of the month. It's a benevolent offering. It goes into an account that is set there for people in need, whether it's medicine or, or material things to pay bills or, or whatever it is, so that we can continue to honor God. We won't be passing anything around today, but there are receptacles in the back, but also in the chairs in front of you are envelopes. You can use that for that special offering put it in there, write benevolence on it, and you can place that in the boxes. If you do that, if you put it in the envelope, write benevolence on it, place it in the box, it goes directly into that special account to help meet people's needs. You can also do that online as God puts it on your heart. But let's pray for the, the receiving of these offerings as we close out this time. God, we thank you for your benevolence towards us. May we be benevolent people towards one another. May we give so that other people that have less, they struggle with their food or they struggle with rent or medicine. God, we as a church want to be your hands and your feet to that world, whether it's in our congregation or in our community. Lord, I thank you for the money that has been received to provide ramps for handicapped people for the veteran that had received a new ramp just last month that we partnered with within our community to provide for him. God, may he know that's from you. Lord, we thank you for how you've blessed us and may we be a blessing to others. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with a, with a confession of worship and honoring the Lamb of God. See him there.
story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise. Endless hallelujahs to your hope. God, we thank you because you are here. We thank you that you have touched hearts. God, I thank you for these that have been moved and shaped and molded by your word, being washed by your word. And as we go out to this world, may those, those righteous hearts live in a manner that reflects your glory. May we say no to the things of the world and yes to you and serve you as our master. And most importantly, God, may everything we say and do, whether it's at home or at work or at play, make you smile. We praise you, we thank you, we worship you. Come back, Lord Jesus, soon, but till then, may we honor you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen and praise Jesus. Have a blessed week.